and welcome to the Future Self podcast. I'm Sasha Persineni, a third year student studying a Bachelor of Politics, Philosophy and Economics, as well as a Business Information Systems degree at the Australian National University. I'm passionate about finding out the intersection of policy, technology and economics, as well as business, and figuring out how they can help us find dynamic and innovative solutions to complex problems facing us today. Today, I'm joined with distinguished professor Genevieve Bell, the director of the School of Cybernetics, director of the 3A Institute, Florence Violet McKenzie Chair, and a distinguished professor at the Australian National University, as well as the vice president and senior fellow at Intel Corporation. Genevieve is renowned for her work in the field of AI development and regulation, and her exploration of what it means to be a human in a data-driven economy and world. So hello, Genevieve. It's an honor to have the opportunity to speak with you today. How are you going? Doing very well, Sasha. I'm a little bit blown away by how long that introduction of me takes. We should have just said, this is Genevieve. She talks about stuff. <laughs> no, I feel like it's so worthy. You've done so much amazing stuff in your career. Um, and you've combined a lot of aspects of like humanities and ethics, anthropology, as well as emerging technologies together to advise how to approach and solve complex questions about how we ought to interact with technology today, as well as into the future. So personally, I'm really interested and passionate about the marriage of ethics and technology, which seems to be a really promising domain in the future, but seems to have a less obvious marriage maybe 10 or 20 years ago. If you're tracing back through your career, what key moments would you say put you on the path of investigating technology and the humanities together? Oh, such a good question. Uh, in some ways, I don't think it was ever obvious. <laughs> so <laughs> you're right to say, you know, I, I, among many other things, I'm an anthropologist. So uh, key moments, those are relatively straightforward. Um, there's probably four or five of them uh, mm -hmm. in no particular order, maybe not chronological. So I'm Australian, right? I grew up uh, well, here in Canberra, actually, uh, which is where I am now, on the lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. And I spent a lot of my childhood knocking around Canberra, but then I spent the rest of my childhood in the Northern Territory. Mm. So I grew up in a range of different Aboriginal communities uh, in the 1970s and 1980s and living on country with people who were incredibly generous about telling me the stories of their country and of their ways to be in that place, hugely important in setting me on the path I'm on now. Equally probably is that I ran away from Canberra. Uh, I chose not to pursue my higher education in Australia, but I went to America instead. Uh, and I was lucky enough to win a scholarship as an undergraduate to go to the US. And I ended up in a small liberal arts college on the outskirts of Philadelphia in the late 1980s. And that was probably a huge moment of changing my life I and mean, I didn't know anyone there I didn't know anyone in America it was long before the internet was a big thing so it was a bit like leaving home and not being sure when you were going to come back uh, but there was something about both getting to reinvent myself somewhere else and also getting to be in a completely different world with a very different set of rules and expectations that was kind of remarkable mm -hmm. uh, winning a scholarship to Stanford that was a big deal it set me off in a very different path again and you know, ended up with me in the middle of Silicon Valley, which I don't think I really noticed for a while. <laughs> I was doing anthro, not tech. And then landing at Intel. So, I mean, you know, moments where when I look back at the collection of them, each one of them was about not following the obvious path that was laid out ahead of me. I mean, when I went to the US, I'd been admitted to Sydney in the first year of their, their arts law programs so the first double degrees in Australia. Mm. You know, when I was at Bryn Mawr, Stanford wasn't the obvious choice. Certainly when I was finishing at Stanford, I was on the faculty at Stanford and joining the tech sector was an insane thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> and there's multiple moments where I remember knowing what I was being trained for and what the expected direction was and knowing that I was about to step off that path and do something completely different and being willing to just do that anyway. Yeah, for sure. That's extremely interesting. So like specifically, when, when do you think was like the main bridging point between tech and humanities? Would you say that's when you did step into the tech sector? Oh, yeah. What so was, my, yeah. Um, my undergraduate and PhDs were about, um, oh, my, my thesis, is, my, my PhD thesis was about Native American ethno history. So mm -hmm. I ended up spending a year in the National Archives in Washington, D.C., and then a couple of years tracking down people who'd been to one of the first off reservations. So, uh, non-settlement boarding schools in the United States that had operated during the late 1800s and early 1900s. And it was a 
flagship of the government's assimilation era politics and hugely important in activating a generation of Native American political activists mm -hmm. and of creating a very complicated dynamic in terms of Indigenous politics and polity in America. And my research there was really related to the archive that was left at the school because the school had closed in 1918. And so what was left was 80 linear feet of records and about 12 people who were still alive and then all the children and grandchildren. And mm. so I spent a lot of time kind of exploring issues about identity and the ways the government policy shapes individual and collective lives and about the ways people use spaces to resist government policy. And I don't think I was really thinking about technology in any of that per se, but you know, there's technology involved in those stories railways and telegraph in particular. Um, but no, it wasn't until I was at Stanford um, and I'd finished my PhD and I was on the faculty and I had a sort of, I was starting to look up and around me at that point and realizing that I was in the center of, well, a fairly large technology build up. And I had points mm -hmm. of view about it. I knew a lot of people in the tech sector was hard not to at that point, they were kind of everywhere. And I knew people who were running startups and working for tech companies. And there were a lot of conversations about that. And the Intel, initial Intel interview was kind of a lark, right? I did it as a favor to a friend of mine. I hadn't really expected it would go anywhere. And I, as a result, I probably didn't treat it very seriously. <laughs> um, and mm -hmm. it ended up, it ended up turning into one of those extraordinary opportunities that when it it finally became clear what I was being offered. It seemed insane to say no to it, even though saying yes to leaving the academy and leaving a tenure track job to join a large tech company probably seemed bonkers at the time to my, my colleagues and my peers. But yeah, 1998 is the moment when I leave Stanford and join Intel. Wow. Well, actually, that's a great segue to one of my next questions. So you helped build up the social science laboratory capacity at Intel. So how did you go about setting that up, especially if that was one of the first instances of really marrying that social science capacity in a technology space. Yeah, so before I joined Intel, there had been other anthropologists in tech companies, uh, starting with a man named Lloyd Warner, who worked at General Electric in the 1930s and 1940s. Uh, people like Margaret Mead and Gregory Bateson had been involved in commercial enterprises and in helping shape government policy in the United States. Uh, mm. There certainly were anthropologists in Australia shaping policy as it related to Aboriginal people. And then in the 1970s, there were a group of anthropologists at Xerox Park. So people like Lucy Suchman and Julian Orr and Jeanette Blomberg, who'd created a small group there studying work and work patterns. So when I joined Intel, there had been other research social scientists in tech companies. They'd mostly been in R&D labs, which is where I landed too. Um, and they'd mostly been studying work at that point and ideas about work and labor. Mm -hmm. uh, when I joined Intel Labs in 1998, there were two social scientists already there with backgrounds in psychology and linguistics. Uh, and collectively, we decided that there was something about understanding what people cared about that should be part of the way you talked about new technology. And it, it's important to remember that Intel at that point is a microprocessor company. So they're not a device manufacturer. They weren't kind of an Apple and they weren't a software company, so not a Microsoft. And they certainly weren't, you know, one of the new companies, which at that point were people like Google and Amazon. Instead, they were a hardware manufacturer and they made chips, basically the chip that's likely sitting inside of the laptop on your desk, uh, that at that point was certainly in all your desktops, <laughs> as we're talking. Mm -hmm. the um, and they had a 10 year life cycle, right? So a 10 year design cycle, you'd start doing pathfinding to think about what the next microprocessor line would look like 10 years before it would ship out the door. Yeah. One of my colleagues used to laugh that we spent our weekdays in the future and we visited the present on weekends because you were always kind of living 10 years out in the labs. And the job of the advanced R&D labs was to try and think about what the future would be like and build product for that and build devices and new ways of doing things. And so the labs that I joined were places that helped create USB, uh, that helped create the MPEG codex that let us share images around. They helped create Wi-Fi and take it from a technology in CSIRO into a, you know, something that was in mass production. They helped create the ways in which DVD players and CD players could sit inside laptops. There was a lot of stuff sort of happening around me. And at that point, the head of the labs wondered whether 
knowing what people cared about and what they might care about would also be a useful thing to feed into the innovation process along with, you know, ideas about radio frequencies <laughs> and, you know, other kinds of standards. And so we built a really tiny lab of us, a collection of us, who had backgrounds in the research social scientists, sciences and in design and in human factors engineering. And really, we thought our job in the early days was to just help the engineers around us see consumers in all their varied guises and sort of habits and desires and frustrations. And over the years, we moved from being, I think, in some ways, strictly educational, as in here are stories about people from somewhere else who aren't like you, to building prototypes of objects that we'd never thought would go into production, but were a way of trying to tell a story and to make our insights come to life, to then actually creating product and all those things. And so in the early days, part of the challenge was recruiting people. Not everyone wanted to work in a big tech company. Not everyone un understood the value of what we were doing. Uh, and then once you got there, the challenge was working out how to be successful inside a large tech company. That was challenging too. Mm. Uh, and learning how to talk to engineers because that wasn't necessarily what everyone grew up with in the university settings. So in the early days, it was a combination of sheer brute force and a lot of playfulness. Wow, that's amazing. So a lot of, I guess, it seems that you really had to imagine your own job in some respect, I guess, like where you had to, you know, really. No, Sasha, that's absolutely right. So at Intel, they used to talk about when I first got there, one of the things they used to say was that you, you owned your own career. Mm. And what they meant was that because the company was still small then, it's doubled in size since I've been there, and the industry has really changed. But the idea was that it was your responsibility to navigate your job through the company. Yeah. And it also did mean you're absolutely right. In the case for most of us, not only were we creating the jobs, we were helping people understand how to measure us. So we would give presentations and we'd say, okay, here's what we're going to tell you. Here are the questions or the kinds of questions you should ask us. <laughs> Here are the sort of metrics that might make sense to assess our work because people just hadn't encountered that sort of work before. And so, yeah, we were creating the jobs, creating our own measures of success, and trying to educate people as to the value of it all at the same time. Yeah, so, okay, I guess in that, like, kind of vein, what advice would you give to somebody who may want to invent their kind of, their own job in that respect as well, especially maybe marrying or introducing concepts of both technology and social science in ways that might not necessarily be uh, obvious to most people or trying to find, like, a creative way of getting a new job? What would be your main advice to start on that path? Oh, another good question. Listen, I think the couple of things that made us really successful in those early years was that we, we understood that this was not about anyone meeting us halfway. We knew we were going to have to go 80% to 90% of the way. So yeah. we knew that we needed to not just be really good at our jobs, but we needed to understand the jobs of everyone else around us. We needed to understand the way our colleagues thought, the way they mm -hmm. talked, understand their kind of regimes of value, like what did they care about? We had to learn what were the cycles where they would care. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> when, did, when did budget cycles happen? When were reports due? When were people open to listening to new kinds of things? So we had to do a lot of homework. And we had yeah. to be um, willing to willing to imagine that the rest of the world wasn't just like us. I used to sometimes mm. say that I used to have to think about Intel as a field site. So as an anthropologist, I used to sort of think about it as a place I was studying, not just a place I was working, because I wanted to sort of make sense yeah. of it that way. So I think if you want to create a job where one doesn't exist, you have to do a lot of homework. You need to work mm. out why that job hasn't existed there before. You have to work out what are the rules and ways that place functions. Not necessarily because you want to follow them, but you need to know what the rules are so you can work out which ones you should break and which ones yeah. you can stick by. Uh, and it also helps you work out where if you need to tell a different kind of story inside a set of constraints where that will work. So when we were first at Intel, it was a very PowerPoint-driven company. And it was a black yeah. and white PowerPoint, uh, three bullet points per, per PowerPoint slide and no more than yeah. 20 words. 
but it was a really mm-hmm. word heavy, lots of graphs, lots of numbers, black and white. And everyone circulated ideas in PowerPoint. And yeah. it will sound crazy, but 20 years ago, the most radical thing we could do was stop using words and just start using pictures. <laughs> so we're using, <laughs> using pictures around and people are like, oh my God, what is this? This is so radical. You're like, not really. But it was different enough that it caught people's attention. And then you had to know how to fill the space that that created. So short answer to how do you create a job where one doesn't exist is you have to do your homework. You need to yeah. fully understand how that place functions. Mm-hmm. And it need to be brave enough and have enough perseverance and enough faith in yourself to stand your ground because chances are you won't get very well heard the first or the second time and you need to be able to pick yourself mm-hmm. up, dust yourself off and go back and try again. And maybe modify it a little bit and take on what you're hearing and be willing to learn a tremendous amount about where everyone else is coming from so that you can work out how to most usefully be heard in that context but it requires a lot of work yeah I can imagine well I guess this kind of leads on to my next question as well but so it seems like as the chair of the 3A Institute much of what your current work is centered around is establishing those rules and methods to use artificial intelligence data and technology in meaningful ways that benefit mankind so in your view what are the major challenges facing governments and businesses in the adoption of increasingly interconnected and complex technologies. Do you think your background in having to establish all those rules and kind of push the envelope has helped inform the way that you develop these ideas? Oh, absolutely. Because I think, you know, as we start to move into a world of increasingly complex technical tools and systems, one of the challenges for many governments and industries is starting to be able to even see the system. I mean, I think for me, one of the things that this whole pandemic experience has just made so abundantly clear is that the system and the idea of a system feel like this really important unit of analysis, like a thing that we really need to be oriented to better. And so challenge number one is how do you get organisations and individuals within those organisations to see the systems that they are implementing and instrumenting and using? How do you get them to sort of understand the importance of the system? Now, once you've got them to think about that, how do you get them to see how those systems might be changed if you add new technologies to them, particularly AI, but not always? And so for me, usually there's a couple of things that are important. First step is to get everyone to a shared understanding of what everyone's talking about. Um, I find myself in a lot of organisations where people talk about AI and it's relatively easy to discover that most people don't have a shared understanding of what they mean when they say that phrase. Yeah. So part of it is how do you get to a shared understanding of the problem statement? I think sometimes there's a little bit of work to understand is that the right problem statement? <laughs> like, you know, maybe maybe you're solving the wrong problem. And then I think one of the things that all my time in tech has taught me is that you then have to work out how to have the most diverse set of voices in the room you can get so the widest range of point of views and lived experiences and competencies and then you have to work really hard to hold all those voices in productive discomfort like you have to sort of let there be a little bit of conflict and disagreement and you have to work out how to hold that disagreement until something new emerges out of it and that's a that's a hard skill and not one that we are adapt at teaching And so when I think about how do we move governments and industry and how do we think about the role of new technologies, step one is working out where we think we're adding them. (laughs) Step two is understanding the function of those systems, right, and who are all the constituents of those systems. And then I think it's about how do we have the right set of voices in the room to talk about what needs to happen next. Yeah, well, that's so enlightening. Thank you. So maybe I'll just continue following up with your work of with 3AI, um, how would you define cybernetics and how would you characterise the role of cybernetics in the ways that we move forward in ethics and technology? Mm, another good question, Tasha. So cybernetics is an old idea. Uh, it's a term that's been repeatedly coined over the last 200 years, but most recently in the 1940s. Mm. And in the 1940s, cybernetics was a, a theory for how to think about systems. So remember when I said a minute ago, I thought one of the most important kind of units of analysis of the 21st century is the system. So cyberneticians thought that too. 
And in the 1940s and 1950s, a collection of smart thinkers from all over the world were trying to imagine what the future of computing would look like and how to think about the future of computing where humans were steering that future. And what cybernetics did was theorize a system that had to balance humans and technology in the environment and that that system would have a series of dynamics and feedback loops in it and that you needed to be able to see that whole system and think about the relationships between the human, the technical and the ecological. And so in the 21st century, that feels like a really useful idea, the idea that we should be able to see, analyze, build, regulate, design, secure, and even decommission systems feels like an important kind of key learning for us. And then thinking about how to approach that system where it's not enough to think of it as simply technical, right? You need to be thinking about the people and you need to be thinking about the context and the infrastructure and the ecological Mm. feels to me to be really powerful. So when I think about cybernetics in the 21st century, I think about it as an approach to systems that lets us or forces us to see the system as having to include not just the technology, but people and the environment. Yeah. And I think the other thing that's important to me about cybernetics from the 20th century that I keep wanting to pull forward into the 21st century is that it was, in addition to being a kind of a theory, I think, of cybernetics as having a certain kind of praxis or a kind of a a way of being, not just a way of thinking. Yeah. And that way of being privileged the idea of a diversity of voices for productive discomfort. Mm -hmm. It privileged the idea of a solution that unfolds over multiple conversations, not just one. And also the idea that whatever your system is, it should be sufficiently rigid that it will hold its form, but not so rigid that it will resist being reinterpreted. And then I think the piece I would add to it when you add AI into those systems is that the properties of that system will be emergent over time as in it will change. Mm. Mm. Very interesting. Yeah, that's like, I hadn't thought about it that way because, um, yeah, I've definitely done quite a bit of like systems theory in my degrees, but I'd never really thought of it more in a kind of framework uh, application. I've always seen it more as a technical way of applying systems theory, but that's very interesting. Thank you. Um, One of the things I really like about cybernetics, right, is that it's a lovely addition to systems engineering because it lets us take that step up or out And think about the fact that those systems will always have people in and around them and they will be running inside ecological and environmental contexts. And so for me, it lets you then talk about the responsible and sustainable piece of the equation too, which feels as important as the safe piece. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, this brings me maybe onto my final question. So I had seen online on your Twitter that you're a passionate reader. Uh, Would you have any fun book recommendations maybe on cybernetics or ethics that you could recommend to me? Oh, absolutely. I've always got books to recommend. It's one of my great (laughs) sins in life. Um, I really like Ethan Zuckerman's new book called Mm -hmm. Mistrust, uh, Mm -hmm. which is all about how to think about, well, security and safety or Mm not. Uh, In cybernetics, there's two I really like. So Thomas Ridd's The Rise of the Machine and Andrew Pickering's The Cybernetic Brain. Mm -hmm. And then for fun, mm, what would I say for fun? Uh, For fun, Richard Brattigan's poem called Loving Grace. Well, thank you very much. That's amazing. I will add those to my reading list. I need a little bit more stuff to read during lockdown. So thank you very much for that. You're very welcome. So thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today, Genevieve. It's been truly enlightening to have the opportunity to pick your brain and absolutely wonderful meeting you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. My pleasure, Sasha. Hello, it's Ivana here, the producer of Future Self. And I'm here with Sasha virtually over Zoom. Um, Sasha has just finished talking to Genevieve and so then I thought that I would just catch up with her a little bit to hear a little bit more about her. 
So Sasha, you mentioned that you're doing a um, PPE degree, um, that's philosophy, politics and economics, as well as a Bachelor of Business Information Systems. Um, So I guess I'm just sort of curious about what, if any, intersections there are between those two degrees. For sure. I personally believe that there's a lot of intersection between each of those disciplines. And I think sometimes it might not be very obvious to many people, but I think in a lot of ways, there are so many different frameworks that exist in each of those majors or areas of thinking, but are always very applicable to other areas. So for example, like economics is very much about welfare economics and social benefit from money. Uh, Philosophy a lot of the time is about justifying your actions to as many people as possible with different ways of thinking. Politics is about distributing those uh, those goods and making sure that um, you win public approval from the way that you're doing everything and sharing that benefit around. And then information systems is about the flow of all that information and the way that you communicate all of those things through technology and finding solutions to enable, yeah, the dispersal, the dispersal, sorry, of all that kind of information. So I think in many ways you can find a lot of the intuition from one uh, helps a lot with problems that you might find in another domain. And so I think when trying to find solutions to problems that might not necessarily have a particular obvious answer using the way of thinking from all those disciplines um, a little bit from each can really help find a really creative solution and also find solutions that might take on more perspectives that can help more people so that's definitely why I think there's a bit of overlap and benefit to studying so many different majors. So one of the things that you and Genevieve briefly spoke about was systems. And I sort of feel like systems is one of those things that, you know, is an abstract concept in some ways that um, people might have difficulty uh, understanding properly and sort of comprehending what it means and what its application is. So I was wondering if you might be able to sort of enlighten us a little bit more about systems and what you find fascinating about it, because I know that you do. Sure. Um, I guess the most simple systems um, or the most simple system model is the input output processing, uh, well, input processing output system. So essentially you put some information, so that could just be a bit of information from your computer, it could be language, it could be a picture, then in the middle that gets processed, so the meaning or the coded information in that input gets crunched and transformed into an output that then comes out of the system um, and can be consumed or shared or Uh, even, yeah, just taken on by the person who's putting that stuff into the system. So often there's a feedback loop as we go along. So the most important part of a system most of the time is the feedback. So it's figuring out what's going right, what's going wrong, how can you make the system better? So figuring out a better way of processing that input to make a better output. So a lot of the time systems can become extremely complicated, even your computer, despite its relative simplicity to some other massive pieces of technology we have, is a whole, like a perfect example of how systems, each little individual part has to be fine-tuned and has to be able to deal with so many different inputs at once and outputs so much different information at the same time while not breaking. Um, And part of that feedback loop includes maybe Apple or Microsoft sending you a software update um, to make sure that all the things that are happening in your computer get better. So I think a lot of the time systems don't necessarily have to be technological either. It's sometimes even just the way that we communicate. Um, And I think this is what Genevieve was touching on quite well is often we do need like an anthropological perspective or a sociological perspective to how systems work because we have systems that exist every day in the way that we operate even our social system, for example. And I think understanding um, how that has a meaningful implication, not only for technology, but also for the way that we interact as humans, um, there's a lot of overlap where we can figure out where do we want our technology systems to simulate our social systems and when do we want our social systems to simulate technological systems. And I think that sweet spot in the middle is maybe how we can find ethics or ways of thinking about how to deal with systems that then do 
completely overlap, such as artificial intelligence that might be going into our speed cameras or into the way that we have, I don't know, possibly AI judges or AI police figuring out how we want to sort that out. So I definitely, I think systems are so interesting and definitely a way forward into the future. Mm, Yeah. I mean, and what you've said there is really interesting too, because I guess we want systems and we want technology to um, be informed by our experiences and our values, but then also uh, when new technologies emerge, they present exciting opportunities that we couldn't have thought of. And then, yeah, there is like that feedback loop where we then apply those new technologies um, in ways that we hadn't previously anticipated. Mm, For sure. So you're approaching the end, I suppose, of your studies at the ANU. In speaking to Genevieve, did that sort of throw up any new ideas for you about um, how to where to take your future career and you know what you might like to do when you've finished the two degrees that you're currently doing? For sure, um, I had previously been kind of tossing up going to do my honours or my masters. Um, In the past, I had been hoping to potentially do my honours in philosophy, majoring in or focusing on how ethics interacts with technology. Um, And I did really want to, in the past, I was super interested about the Masters of Applied Cybernetics at the 3AI Institute. Um, And after our conversation with Genevieve, I definitely definitely think that that might be something I do want to pursue and apply to, especially since a lot of what she said towards the end of the interview about cybernetics and using it as a framework to find ways that we can coexist with both like our environment, the social and technological um, is something that really interests me. So I definitely would like to give that a shot, I think now, um, and then maybe head on, try and find a way that I can make my own job myself in some sort of IT domain and try and solve some problems that maybe aren't so obvious just yet. So I understand that the deadlines for the Master of Applied Cybernetics program closes on the 31st of August. So if anyone else is listening and interested in that as well, then I encourage you to get onto uh, the 3AI website and check out those details. So Sasha, thank you so much for your time and thanks for being on Future Self. No worries. Thanks, Ivana. 